It was a perfect relationship. She cooked and I ate. Good evening, everyone. This is Stone Gas Man live from New York City. And tonight we are going to be doing an audio commentary for the 1973 British romantic comedy, A Touch of Class, directed by Melvin Frank and written by Melvin Frank and Jack Rose. Uh, both were nominated for Academy Awards for their uh, screenplay for this movie. And uh, this is a, a film that I always knew existed, but have never seen before. And largely because of the fact that, of course, it always turns up on um, Academy Award discussions. Uh, uh, in this particular case, uh, Glenda Jackson won her second Academy Award for Best Actress after Women in Love directed by Ken Russell in 1969 and uh, based on the D.H. Lawrence book. Uh, but this was unusual territory for Jackson in that, you know, she largely did uh, drama and uh, she's still actually very much acting and still very much with us. She's turning 87 in May and she, uh, you know, is still performing on the stage and everything. So... I must confess that it took me a long time to really discover Glenda Jackson's work. Uh, prior to this uh, uh, movie, I've only seen her in one other film, uh, which was a movie called Hopscotch with uh, Walter Matthau and uh, released by Criterion about 10 years ago. And uh, I had only seen George Siegel in another movie. So this was pretty much very fresh uh, uh territory for me uh, uh, uh but to be look uh, the truth of the matter is i had to do a commentary on this just because of the fact that it won glenda jackson her second oscar and also it got several other nominations including for the music which honestly i wasn't a big fan of the music in this movie and like i said when we get into it we'll uh uh we'll talk all about that uh, but just to let everybody know, I am paused on the name of Joseph E. Levine. Uh, you'll probably recognize his name from a lot of films of that period, particularly uh, The Graduate. And uh, if you want to rent uh, A Touch of Class, you can obtain the movie from Amazon right here for only $3. Like I said, hopefully down the road, if I get a Patreon available, you know, and if I do live commentaries on there, that I could actually show the movie. Uh, but I'm still I'm still not quite there yet, so please forgive me. So, but there's uh, the link where you can rent uh, a touch of class over at Amazon uh, for only three dollars. So uh, we'll we'll probably uh, give it just one more minute and we'll get started here. Um, yeah. So at any rate, so this movie was adapted from uh, Melvin Frank's story. She loves me. She told me so last night, oddly listed as an original song in the film's credits. And it bears more than a passing resemblance to an earlier Frank film called The Facts of Life from 1960, which likewise dealt with a middle-aged couple trying to have an affair and centering on a disaster-laden trip to a place where they would not be recognized. And uh, there, there'll, there'll be a few uh, other familiar faces that pop up in this movie, uh, most notably the uh, late Paul Sorvino, uh, very famous from uh, films like Cruising and Goodfellas. And uh, this was actually one of his early, uh, earliest roles. Uh, and he uh, sadly passed away last year at the age of 83. Um, yeah, very, very recently. So uh, it, it was nice to see Paul Sorvino again. And uh, very young. I mean, yes, a little overweight, but man, I mean, he's uh, he's very, very young in this movie. And uh, even better, we get to see him with his shirt off. <laughs> so if you've always wanted to see Paulie from uh, Goodfellas with his shirt off, this is the movie <laughs> that you need to check out. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, just give me just one second here and I'll bring. Let's see. So <clears throat> I'm actually really excited to go ahead and do this movie because, uh, you know, like I said, this is my first commentary in two months. But anyway, uh, why don't we go ahead and get started here? So I'm paused on A. Joseph E. Levine. I mean, uh, it doesn't say production yet, but we'll, uh, <laughs> this opening kind of makes me laugh a little bit. But uh, so um, <clears throat> let's go ahead and get started. Um on a countdown of three, two, one, 
and play. Make sure the volume is down. Yes, this is a brute production. <laughs> uh, apparently, this uh, movie thinks it's wearing brute. I don't know. <laughs> it actually looks like the logo for brute, too, which is really, uh, really odd. So, yeah, so this movie is set in London. George Siegel. It's funny, before uh, before A Touch of Class, I had only seen George Siegel and Glenda Jackson only in one other movie for both of them. For Glenda Jackson, it was Hopscotch, uh, like I mentioned earlier, with Walter Matthau. Uh, but for George Siegel, I had seen Look Who's Talking, like, so many times when I was growing up. I mean, uh, that, that was uh, one of the big box office hits of uh, 1989, written and directed by Amy Heckerling. And uh, made famous by the fact that, that there's a baby that's given the voice of uh, Bruce Willis. And it's funny that John Travolta was the star of that movie. And of course, in five years, uh, he would also star in Pulp Fiction, which also had Bruce Willis. Uh, it actually took me many, many years to make that connection. But I was like, wait a minute. They did look who's talking together. I mean, sure. I mean, we only heard Bruce Willis's voice, but... <laughs> And George Siegel plays a real cad in uh, Look Who's Talking. I mean, he basically, you know, he gets uh, Christy Alley pregnant uh, when he's married and has kids. And he won't shut up about his kids. Like, he he will never, ever shut up about his wife and kids, despite the fact he's having this, you know, very hot and heavy affair uh, with Christy Alley, who also passed away uh, very, very recently, uh, along with Paul Sorvino. Now, the lead role of Steve, uh, who George Siegel plays in this movie, was actually going to be played by uh, Cary Grant, of all people. Uh, Cary Grant was originally supposed to be the star of A Touch of Class with Glenda Jackson, uh, despite the fact that the, at this point in his uh, life he was uh, twice as old as she was and everything. Uh, and... So Melvin Frank had to rewrite the script to play up the age difference between Steve and Vicky, and he promised to do that when it came to uh, Cary Grant. But he had retired. Uh, by this time, Cary Grant had retired in 1966, and he just wasn't that keen on getting out of retirement. And I don't blame the man. I mean, <laughs> usually, I mean, you know, at that point, it was like, no, 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 I'm done. I'm done. I'm, I'm retired. I, I, I can't, you know, I'm not going to do this anymore. And, you know, admittedly, it would have been very, very odd and a bit creepy uh, had it been Cary Grant, because like I said, at this point in his career, he was literally twice as old as Glenda Jackson. Glenda Jackson was, uh, I, here she is right here, very, very beautiful Glenda Jackson. She's, uh, I think, 36 in this movie. And I know Cary Grant was over 70 at the time, so... Now, Grant opted to remain in retirement, of course, but uh, he turned down, turned the role down. But despite this, he did remain uh, connected to the film. In uh, it was produced by Faber J's Brute Productions. Uh, you just saw the Brute logo, which opened up the movie. And Grant was on the board of directors for Faber J. Then, uh, then they offer the role after Cary Grant bowed out and said, "No, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I support the movie, but I'm not going to be the lead, uh, be the lead uh, uh, of Steve." So then they offer the role to, believe it or not, Roger Moore. Now, this was literally right before Roger Moore became the new James Bond. Uh, he uh, had become James Bond in 1973. In fact, later this year, I'll be doing a commentary for Live and Let Die, which was, in fact, his very first film for uh, Eon Productions. Um, so, but and, and he had to actually drop out of A Touch of Class so he could do Live and Let Die. I mean, you know, come on, you're off with the role of James Bond. I mean, like, yeah, I think I'll pass on A Touch of Class and do uh, this uh, James Bond movie. But he still had a hand in the production. So even though the uh, two original leading men uh, ended up not doing the movie, you know, they still supported the production, which was actually pretty cool. And like I said, this is London and everything. And uh, George Siegel has his eye on Glenda Jackson, who plays a divorced uh, mother of two. 
Although we barely see any of their kids in this movie. I mean, and, you know, honestly, when I, uh, th there's a written by Melvin Frank and Jack Rose. Both were nominated for Oscars for this movie. I like Glenda, Glenda Jackson's uh, blue coat and red uh, uh, bandana that she's wearing here and produced and directed by Melvin Frank. We'll, we'll talk about a lot about Melvin Frank a bit later. Uh, but here is the uh, typical meet cute scenario where they, you know, they end up bumping into each other when they're uh, uh, playing baseball. George Siegel now has his eye on Glenda Jackson. And so they end up sharing this uh, this cab ride together. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, uh, Glenda Jackson revealed that she was approached by director Melvin Frank uh, after appearing on the comedy sketch and variety program, The More Cam and Wise Show on the BBC in the United Kingdom in the uh, Antony and Cleopatra sketch. And after her role in this film, she won the Oscar. Eric Morikambe sent her a telegram reading, we'll stick with us and we'll get you another one. <laughs> now I got to confess that I, um, even though I liked Glenda Jackson's performance in this movie, I will admit that I, you know, I do see why she won the Oscar. I mean, she is very funny, very sharp, uh, very, very quick witted. And, uh, I mean, she does uh, really deliver a performance in this movie. The problem I have with her winning the Oscar is that, and it's, you know, this is something I've actually, you know, I've had a, a problem with the Academy. And of course, they're never going to listen to me, obviously. But one thing I've always had a big problem with the uh, Academy Awards is when they tend to give the same Oscar to the same person for the same category. Um, one of my, uh, I, I still am very upset at the fact that, like I said, for as an example, like the director of Mad Max Fury Road, George Miller. Uh, he lost uh, to the same director who had won the previous year for The Revenant, which I thought was, well, well, come on, man. I mean, you know, he already has an Oscar. Why does he have to, uh, why does he need another one? Uh, personally, if I was uh, rewriting the uh, rules of the Academy, I would say, okay, once they win for that category, they cannot win again for that same category. Instead, they would have to wait for a Lifetime Achievement Oscar. Because why not give other people a chance to actually win, uh, uh, you know, those awards? I mean, I, I actually strongly feel that way. I mean, people are talking about Spielberg winning a third Oscar for the, for the Fablemans or whatever. And it just... Give it to somebody else, anybody else, you know. Actually, the turning point for me when I was, you know, when it came to multiple Oscars for the same role actually was with Meryl Streep. And I adore Meryl Streep, okay? I've watched a lot of her uh, Academy Award-nominated performances, particularly, you know, the obscure ones like One True Thing and Music of the Heart and, you know, other movies like that. And when she won the uh, third Oscar for The Iron Lady, which was not a good movie, okay? I mean, whatever your feelings are on Margaret Thatcher, uh, that was not a good movie at all, I thought. Uh, <laughs> but she won her third Oscar for that against Glenn Close. Uh, uh, Glenn C Close had actually been playing the same role of Albert Nobbs since doing it on the stage in 1982. And I thought... Oh my God! Well, this is the perfect opportunity to give that Oscar to Glenn Close because she had never won before, and they gave it to Meryl Streep. Like, damn it! <laughs> it's, you know, and like when they gave Sean Penn the Oscar for Milk, even though he had previously won for Mystic River. Well, Mickey Rourke lost out on his chance to win Best Actor for The Wrestler. You know, I mean, and those are just you know several examples of of just you know why give them another Oscar when they already have one. You know, and, and it could be any other awards in any of the arts. And I'm sure, you know, people could make other arguments like, well, to me, you know, an achievement in acting, in a, an achievement in acting, once you reach that Oscar level, how further are you going to go? I mean, you know, aside from getting a Lifetime Achievement Award. And so it isn't Glenda Jackson's performance I have an issue with in Touch of Class. It's just the fact that she already won. And that was for 1969's Women in Love, which I actually saw for the ver very first time today, directed by Ken Russell, based on the novel by uh, D.H. Lawrence. 
And that movie is actually particularly famous for a nude wrestling scene in front of a fireplace uh, between uh, Oliver Reed <laughs> and uh, Alan Bates. Uh, I, I, like I said, when I saw this for the first time, I was like, wow, 1969 audiences really got an eyeful because this was really one of the first times that male genitalia had ever been seen in major motion pictures. And Glenda Jackson... Wonderful. I mean, you know, Ken Russell's camera really gave her a showcase in that. I think her show-stopping moment in Women in Love is, you know, when she's doing a kind of like a spiritual dance. And, you know, she ends up, you know, seeing these, uh, you know, I, I guess they were cattle, even though I thought they looked more like yaks. Uh, but... You know, and then she get you know she starts you know charming Oliver Reed you know with Ken Russell's camera work and everything. It's really something to see. Um, if you want to see Women in Love, it is available in a Criterion edition. Uh, I personally would not buy it, uh, <laughs> uh, even though I thought it was a uh, a gorgeous movie. I mean, you know, typical of Ken Russell's movies. You know, there's a lot to really absorb uh, visually and otherwise. But, you know, Glenda Jackson had already won that Oscar for Women in Love. And so I, I just think that this was kind of a, a kind of a wasted uh, award in, in terms of here again, nothing to do with her, nothing to do with her performance, because she is, you know, lovely in this movie. It's just the fact I wish they would have given it to somebody else who had not won before. And as a matter of fact, let me just go ahead and bring up. Who were the other nominees that year in 1973? A lot of people think that the uh, Oscar should have actually went to Ellen Burstein uh, for The Exorcist, which, you know, worthy enough nomination, absolutely worthy. Uh, she's really good, even though the next year she would win for uh, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, which is one of my favorite Martin Scorsese movies. Uh, among the other nominees for Best Actress in 1973 and who uh, Glenda Jackson was up against, uh, Ellen Burstein for The Exorcist, Marsha Mason for Cinderella Liberty, which I will be doing a commentary on later this year. Uh, very much looking forward to that. James Caan plays a, um, uh, a sailor who falls in love with a prostitute who has a illegitimate black child. Uh, and, the, and the prostitute is played by Marsha Mason, who is terrific in that movie. Uh, Barbara Streisand was also nominated for The Way We Were. And then finally, Joanne Woodard won for Summer Wishes and Summer Wishes Winter Dreams, uh, which I've never seen before. Now, I want to reserve any uh, personal choice for uh, my personal favorite acting performance by a, by a, an actress in 1973 until the end of the year. Because uh, last year, just to get, give everybody an idea, last year the winner was, of course, Liza Minnelli for Cabaret, uh, Bob Fosse's Cabaret, which is, you know, absolutely worthy win. Uh, the thing is, is that after I saw Lady Sings the Blues, uh, I came to the, um, I came to the uh, conclusion that, you know what, I would have voted for Diana Ross. Me personally, as much as I like Liza Minnelli, Minnelli in Cabaret, I would have voted for um, Diana Ross and Lady Sings the Blues. And uh, but I and I've never seen, I've seen Exorcist, I've seen Cinderella Liberty, I've seen The Way We Were, and now I've seen A Touch of Class. Uh, the only one I haven't seen is Summer Wishes, uh, Winter Dreams, which Joanne Wood Woodward got the nomination for that. That movie also has Martin Balsam, Sylvia Sidney, and Drew Hughes. And um, hmm. she plays a depressed middle-aged New Yorker, prone to nightmares, and, and when she does dream more, that more pleasant thoughts, they are of her childhood on the family farm. I guess I will see that movie later. Whether I do a commentary or not is uh, uh, questionable at this point. But um, 
Now, A Touch of Class was also nominated for four other Oscars, uh, believe it or not. It was also nominated for um, Best Picture. And, of course, it, it lost to The Sting. And it was also non nominated for Best uh, Adapted Screenplay. And that went to The Exorcist, which... Um, you know, I can't really argue with that. <laughs> I can't really argue with that win at all. But yeah, it went to. Uh... Oh no, I'm sorry. Uh, material or uh, not previously produced or published, it actually lost to the Sting. Uh, Exorcist won Best Adapted Screenplay, and the Sting won Best Original Screenplay. Uh, here again, can't argue with that. Can't argue with that at all. Now, what I will argue with is <laughs> the music in this movie. Uh, I overall enjoyed A Touch of Class, and despite the ending, which a lot of uh, critics at the time found to be very disappointing and unsatisfying, I actually enjoyed this as a romantic comedy, but at the same time, I also felt that it kind of, it doesn't drop the ball necessarily near the end, but I do think that it, it misses... Uh, several opportunities to really you know go above and beyond the genre um and like i said not a lot of romantic comedies get noticed from uh, the awards ceremonies but this one did uh but here's the, the thing for a romantic comedy i think that this the music is actually a very important element that needs to be considered for this kind of thing and to be perfectly honest, I mean, I did not like the score and I did not like the song. Uh, the song, which was All That Love Went to Waste, with music by George Berry and lyrics by Sammy Kahn. Uh, here again, I think it's one of the weaker uh, elements of this movie, along with the score. There were some points in this movie where the score just got on my nerves. I mean, th there's one near the end there's just you know the song go the the music tends to go on and on where all you hear is do 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 no literally that's literally the score do 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 like come on i mean there's nothing romantic about that there's nothing funny about that uh it's just annoying and you know so I can understand the other nominations and I can even understand Glenda Jackson winning but man, the music in this film is awful. And I really do think it brings it down from what it could have been. I mean, when it comes to romantic comedies, I think music is one of the you know absolute most important elements. And unfortunately for A Touch of Class, I do think that they are among the weakest elements. Now, here we have, you know, some comedy where, you know, George Siegel has to, you know, um, and look, I actually completely agree with Glenda Jackson's assessment in this movie. Like, you know, why do we have to, you know, if we're going to have uncomplicated sex, fine. But do we have to get like a, a place where the where the sheets don't get changed for, you know, at least a week? Hey, I agree with her. You know, why not? You know, of course, uh, you know, today this would be like an Airbnb scenario. I mean, this was years before Airbnb <laughs> where, you know, he has to get tickets to uh, go to Italy and they're going to stay at a hotel. Uh, <laughs> happy Mother's Day. Yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, you know, very, you know, silly. We've seen this before. That That's the thing, is that when I finally watched A Touch of Class, I said to myself, you know what? We've seen these scenarios before. We've seen, the, you know, variations of uh, these situations before where, you know, he has to keep this affair under wraps and he, you know, he doesn't want his wife to find out. He has to be discreet about it and all that, you know, buying plane tickets or making hotel reservations, you know. And George Siegel, I mean, here again, it took me a while for me to warm up to George Siegel in this movie. Um, I think I've, I've seen Look Who's Talking so many damn times that I still, you know, see his very, um, you know, very, you know, horrible cat in that movie. But, um, <clears throat> and let's see. Speaking of George Siegel, let's uh, talk a little bit about him because we'll we'll talk more about Glenda Jackson a bit later. But um, oh, actually, it should be uh, noted that uh, George Siegel's wife, right here, uh, is played by an actress named Hildegard Neal. 
uh, who is still with us. She is 83 years old. She's actually only uh, three years uh, younger than uh, Glenda Jackson. And uh, she was born in London, raised in South Africa, first appeared on television in a BBC school's television production of Julius Caesar in 1963. And after that, appeared mostly as a guest artiste in a variety of television series over the last 40 years. She also appeared in several films and on stage, both in the West End and touring. Now she's married to actor Brian Blessed. And uh, if uh, if anybody has seen Flash Gordon, then they know that uh, Brian uh, Blessed plays uh, um, <laughs> Gordon's alive. Yeah, that guy. <laughs> she's married to him. And they have a daughter together and everything, who is also an actress. Uh, on May 23rd, 2009, Neil appeared with her husband on the ITV entertainment show All Star Mr. and Mrs., on which it was established that she is a keen Liverpool FC supporter. She also spent a season at the Royal Shakespeare Company playing a variety of roles, including Gertrude in Hamlet. She played Lady Macbeth in Ewan Hooper's production of Macbeth at the Green Greenwich Theatre, which opened on February 18th, 1971. And uh, But she didn't do a lot of films. Uh, before A Touch of Class, she was only in two films, The Man Who Haunted Himself and uh, Antony and Cleopatra, where she uh, did, in fact, play Cleopatra. And uh, we're not talking about Glenda Jackson here. We're talking about uh, George Siegel's wife, who we'll see intermittently uh in, you know in later scenes but we i mean really she she has a very very thankless role in in touch of class i mean it you know uh but she was also in uh the mirror cracked with angela lansbury based on the agatha christie book and then uh she was in the 1997 version of Macbeth as a witch the 1999 version of king lear as the fool and um, she did some other stuff in the 2000s, as well as uh, television shows like The Adventures of Don Quick, Orson Welles' Great Mysteries, Hotel Babylon, and uh, uh, she's also in a show called Doctors, uh, which is a British medical soap opera um, set in the uh, West Midlands, where they have 40, 4,300 episodes now of that show. It's been going on for like 23 years or something like that. So, uh, yeah, uh, th there she is right there. Mm -hmm. Hildegard Neal. Yeah. So, but yeah, she, she's still very much working, still very much working like Glenda, like Glenda Jackson. And, uh, you know, I mean, here again, I can see some people watching this movie. I mean, back then as well as now being like, well, wait a minute. I mean, she, you know, his wife is perfectly beautiful and charming. Why does he have, have to have this affair? And, you know, you know, honestly, I think this all started with the movie Fatal Attraction, Attraction, where, you know, I constantly have to question characters on why they have to have these affairs, you know, and oddly enough, it was because of Unfaithful the Richard Gere movie with Diane Lane, where I finally more or less got it. Look, just sometimes, you know, when the right situation comes upon themselves, you know, adults being adults and being human, you know, they're just going to want to do what they want to do. And if they find another person attractive and think, well, you know, let's just, do, you know, let's just do this, you know, and everything. But, you know, here again, when it comes to movies about affairs, it just, it, it always, uh, the thing always gets into the back of my mind, well, this is never going to work, okay? I mean, either, you know, stop, you know, stop bullshitting and actually get a divorce and, and be with the person you love, or, you know, end it, uh, you know, just to make sure that, you know, it doesn't grow into anything more harmful and complicated. Because you got to remember, there are kids involved here, you know, <laughs> on both sides of the aisle. And, you know, for the first half of this movie, and A Touch of Class, like I said, being a romantic comedy is actually very funny uh, in many moments. Uh, there are some silly moments, too. But when I saw this, I was thinking, you know what, there's a lot of things that th are, are threatening to go wrong left and right. And, you know, it's almost like karma with George Siegel's character in that, you know, you know, things that will start to go wrong, you know, he's going to screw up somewhere along the way and everything but um yeah here they are you're they're, they're gonna, about to go to italy of course they're pretending like they don't know each other and everything and um 
And uh, we're going to be uh, meeting here uh, Paul Sorvino here very, very soon. Uh, anybody uh, watching, uh, please let uh, let me know uh, how you are in the comment section, if you've seen A Touch of Class before and what you think of it. And here we have the wonderful Paul Sorvino. Yeah, rest in peace. Paul Sorvino just uh, passed away last July. And uh, here he plays an American movie producer, uh, believe it or not. And he basically plays George Siegel's friend who, uh, you know, eventually becomes wind of this affair and has to give him advice and everything. They actually refer to him as, as the fat friend uh, a number of times. <laughs> so, but I like Paul Servino. You know, I mean, virtually every movie I've seen him in, he always brings something to the table. You know, he, he's, you know, very, very entertaining to watch. And, and here in A Touch of Class, it's... Uh, no exception. I actually kind of wish he was nominated for this role. I mean, it's, uh, you know, like I said, it's, you know, the juicy, you know, this almost sidekick role that, you know, almost becomes the uh, the voice of uh, reason later on and everything. But as, you know, as most people know, most people know Paul Servino as uh, playing the uh, Lucchese crime family uh, lord, Polly Cicero. Uh, based on the real-life gangster of Paul Vario and Martin Scorsese's Goodfellas. Uh, and he also played NYPD Sergeant Phil Serrata on the second season of the television series Law and Order. Also played a variety of father figures, including Juliet's father in Romeo and Juliet in 1996, as well as guest appearances as the father of Bruce Willis's character uh, in the TV series Moonlighting and the father of Jeff Garland's character on The Goldbergs. He was in additional supporting roles in Reds, The Rocketeer, Nixon, and The Cooler. And uh, he actually had a very strong relationship with Warren Beatty uh, for a number of years. Did uh, uh, many of his films, uh, not only Reds, but he was also in Bullworth, uh, which is one of my personal favorites. And uh, he was also in the last film that Warren Beatty directed called um, Rules Don't Apply, where he played Vernon Scott. Uh, but Rules Don't Apply, that was the film where Warren Beatty played uh, Howard Hughes. Uh, and a uh, very underrated little movie. Not a lot of people saw it. But yeah, Paul Sorvino uh, popped up in that movie as well. And as many people know, his daughter is uh, the very beautiful Mira Sorvino, who uh, won the Academy Award eventually in 1995 for um, Woody Allen's Mighty Aphrodite. But yeah, it, it is wonderful seeing Paul Servino, uh, very super young in this movie too. I mean, I mean, he was uh, he was only 34, 33, 34. I mean, that's what I'm saying. I can't get over how young he is in this movie. <laughs> really. Mm. And uh, he only made a few other movies before A Touch of Class. I mean, like I said, this is one of his earlier earliest roles. Uh, his film debut was actually in 1970 in the film Where's Papa? And then uh, he was in the Al Pacino movie The Panic in Needle Park. And he would later play Al Pacino's uh, uh, police sergeant in uh, 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 Cruising, where he sends Al Pacino undercover into the... Uh, gay s &M subculture of New York City do find a serial killer. Mm -hmm. And also before A Touch of Class, he also made the movie Dealing or the Berkeley to Boston 40 Brick Lost Bag Blues, where John Lithgow has an, a very early role as a, a pot dealer. <laughs> it actually sounds very interesting, but Paul Servino, he plays a, a, a taxi driver in that movie. And he was also in The Gambler, and he played Reverend Willie, Willie Williams in Oh God. Uh, also The Brinks Job, Lost and Found, I, The Jury. And he was also in Larry Cohen's uh, cult classic The Stuff, uh, where he played Colonel Malcolm Gromit Spears. Uh, I think a lot of people know him from that one as well. And the same year he did Goodfellas, he also did Dick Tracy also directed by Warren Beatty, 
where he played Lips Manless. So like I said, I mean, he he worked with Al Pacino a number of times and he worked with Warren Beatty a number of times. I think Goodfellas was the only time he worked with Robert De Niro. But um, And he, of course, he also played Henry Kissinger in Nixon, where he was nominated for a Screen Actors Guild Award for Outstanding Performance by a Cast in Motion Picture. Mm -hmm. And Money Talks, Most Wanted, uh, C-Spot Run, Hey Arnold, the movie, The Cooler, Repo, the genetic opera, The Devil's Carnival, Once Upon a Time in Queens, and he also, and his last movie, I mean, there's still a few other movies that haven't been released yet that will be released posthumously this year, uh, including Pursued and My Jurassic Place. I don't know what exactly what those are. Uh, his last movie he did with uh, D.B. Sweeney and Dean Cain called The Ride, uh, which came out last year. But yeah, like I said, passed away at the age of 83. <clears throat> and so here, uh, Glenda Jackson and uh, <laughs> it's, uh, George Siegel arrive at the hotel in Italy where, of course, nobody is uh, out to uh, get their bags for them. <laughs> so and so this opens the door for a number of, I love this whole hotel room sequence. And <laughs> just George Siegel just trying to get all the golf clubs and stuff. I mean, like you're going to Italy to have an affair with a, with a, with a gorgeous British woman. Why the hell do you need your golf clubs? Okay. I'm just saying. <laughs> And I love this uh, this hotel manager right here, the night hotel manager. I had recognized him before, and I was like, oh, my God, who is that guy? I know I've seen him in other movies. And uh, that is, in fact, um, a gentleman by the name of Nadim Sawala. Uh, he is a Jordanian-British actor, the father of actresses Nadia and Julia Sawala. And if you recognize him, believe it or not, if you're a James Bond fan, then you'll recognize him as being in two James Bond movies, the first of which was The Spy Who Loved Me, where he played uh, Vekish. Uh, he was the guy that Jaws had to get the microfilm from, and he bit him in the neck, if you remember. Um, or Vekish, is that his name? Uh Yeah, Aziz Fekish, that, that was his name. And he was also in The Living Daylights, uh, the James Bond movie with Timothy Dalton, where he played uh, the Tangier police chief. And uh, he, did a, he had done a number, number of other films like Vampira, The Wind of the Lion, uh, The Return of the Pink Panther, uh, Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger, Young Sherlock Holmes, The, the Nativity Story, and uh, his last movie was in 2018 called Tell Aviv on Fire. And uh, he is still with us. He is 87 years old. Definitely still with us. There he is right there, Nadim Sawala. But he's really funny in this movie. I mean, he just, it kills me that, yeah, that, that's the whole thing. They just wanted a view of Gibraltar. Gibraltar. They didn't want to see, see laundry hanging right outside their hotel room window. And so, you know, of course, he's reluctant, like, oh, so I have to go upstairs and show you another room and another room. I mean, this goes on and on. But here again, very, very funny stuff. Very funny stuff. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what we like, senor, is a room with a view and a toilet with a seat. <laughs> he just... <laughs> oh, Nadim Sawala, he's awesome in this movie. <laughs> he really is. He really is. Hmm. So, yeah, now they have to go up to another room. <laughs> oh, good stuff. Good stuff. I mean, the majority of this movie is actually very funny. I mean, there are silly moments to be sure. Uh, but, you know, th there's some really good dialogue. There's some uh, wonderfully witty lines and everything. And then the third act happens, which, uh, you know, not everybody was uh, happy about how this uh, 
movie resolved, which we'll eventually get to. But um, I see <laughs> some of Glenda Jackson's uh, reactions to uh, these situations are priceless as well. I mean, don't get me wrong. I can totally see why the Academy and, uh, you know, everybody else fell in love with her at the time where they gave her two Oscars, you know, one for women in love and one for a touch of class. But, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Lovely view of Gibraltar right there. Absolutely lovely, lovely view of Gibraltar. <laughs> Very interesting choices of bedroom attire. <laughs> so, I don't know. I, I, I actually, if I was, if I, if I was in his position, I would just be wearing the bathrobe and nothing else. But you know, hey, <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, the need to, to put on pajamas when you're just going to take them off anyway. I mean, I've never understood that in some of these old movies. Like, what, what's the point of actually wearing the pajamas? You know. Why, why don't why not just have sex and then when you're done then put on the pajamas and go to sleep I, I don't <laughs> I don't get why they have to do that now, maybe because of the actors just don't want to appear nude but yeah now here they have this little you know their first of their many little arguments or tiffs essentially where you know, he's like, oh, can I be on your side? It's like, well, no, no, I, I'm going to be on this side because I'm most comfortable on this side. Look, I'm just saying, look, I mean, you know, gentlemen out there, whether you're having affairs or not, look, just let the woman be as comfortable as possible. I mean, why do you have to, why do you have to complain about these type of things? You know, <laughs> just let the woman be as comfortable as possible. But it just doesn't work for me. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, uses the excuse I'm deaf in my left ear. Like, so? Like, <laughs> you can steer, still hear her, right? You know? <laughs> Why don't you just slip over and I'll slide under? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And let's see. Um, the film was uh, shot by a man uh, by the name of Austin Dempster. And the film was also edited by uh, Bill Butler, who passed away in 2017. He was an English film editor. I think he did a good job with this movie. He had just come off of uh, editing uh, Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. Uh, you want to talk about jumping from one type of film to another. You can't get any more different than the. <laughs> Uh, I mean, Clockwork Orange and uh, and uh, A Touch of Class, they're in completely different galaxies. And wouldn't you know it, he just had to have a spasm. And here again, I think it goes along with, you know, these little things sprinkled in the script, you know, to let him know, hey, you know, <laughs> this is karma, okay? You're married, you're having an affair in another country with this British woman, Look, these things are going to happen, you know. Buenos dias, senores. Another beautiful day in Costa del Sol. <laughs> like I said, all this stuff made me laugh the first time I saw it. I mean, it's really, really funny stuff. How do you say doctor in Italian? Or Spanish, rather. <laughs> what is Spanish for doctor? <laughs> Oh, yeah, I think I might have said before that they went to Italy. No, actually, they went to Spain, I believe. But ultimately, does it really matter? <laughs> does it really matter where they're going to go to conduct this affair? I don't think so. <laughs> um, but Bill Butler, he also directed other films directed by Melvin Frank, including uh, Buno Sarah, Mrs. Campbell in 1968. And uh, the Duchess and the Dirtwater Fox in 1976, which I believe also had George uh, Seagal. Yes, it did. Uh, that movie also had Goldie Hawn. Mm -hmm. And uh, the editor, Bill Butler, he passed in Sherman Oaks, California in 2017. Clockwork Orange was listed as the 40th 
best edited film of all time in a 2012 survey of members of the Motion Picture Editors Guild. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I'll agree with that. <laughs> Clockwork Orange is a hell of a movie. And yeah, it's uh, brilliantly edited. Brilliantly edited. So how do you feel? Oh, better. <laughs> yeah, but no sex for you tonight. <laughs> you can put him back in bed now. <laughs> Now, I know this is a very tiny complaint, but Glenda Jackson's character actually smokes in this movie. I I'll tell you, I that's the biggest turnoff to me. I mean, I mean, if you're going to kiss a woman that actually smokes cigarettes, I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I can't I can't deal with, uh, you know, kissing a mouth, with, you know, that tastes like an ashtray. I can't deal with that. But uh, uh, one of the only things about Glenda Jackson's character that is, uh, dare I say it, unsexy. But what I also find hilarious is that she took like maybe one puff and then she just left the rest of the cigarette in the ashtray. So how are you enjoying the trip so far? <laughs> uh, all right, she's like, I'm done. I'm just going to go to sleep now. Oh, you don't want to go into the covers? Nah, nah, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> don't have to get under the covers. <laughs> now, uh, the music in this film, which I mentioned before, I did not like the music at all, um, despite the fact it was nominated for an Oscar. Uh, but the music is actually by uh, John Cameron, who is a British composer, arranger, conductor, and musician. Uh, well known for his many film, TV, and stage credits and his contributions to pop recordings, notably those by Donovan, Cilla Black, and the group Hot Chocolate. Cameron's in instrumental version of Led Zeppelin's Whole Lot of Love became a hit for his group CCS, and for many years, a version of Cameron's arrangement was used as theme music for the BBC TV show Top of the Pops. Uh, very, very famous BBC t television show, which... Honestly, I never really knew the existence of until I saw the uh, the uh, documentary by Edgar Wright called uh, The Sparks Brothers, uh, which I uh, highly, highly recommend. Now, this woman who uh, Glenda Jackson runs into uh, is uh, her, her name is Patty Menk. Uh, really? Is it? I thought it was. Hmm. Bump into an American lady named Patty. Yeah. Uh, an actress by the name of Kay Callen. Uh, just Kay. That, that's just her name. It's just her first name, Kay, even though it's uh, short for Catherine Elizabeth Callen. Um, again, still with us, 87 years old best known for playing Clark Kent's mother, Martha, in Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman. Now, here's a, a particularly... Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, this shot is amazing right here. As you can see, uh, Glenda Jackson is uh, doing a little sunbathing. And uh, as her character points out that she has just put on her skin about uh, two bottles of very, very expensive lotion. And so she's all oiled up and um <laughs> George Siegel yeah he just comes out he's like uh I can touch my toes so we can have sex now <laughs> <sighs> very inconvenient like very very inconvenient you know I just greased myself okay uh, that that might even make it better <laughs> Of course he couldn't help but notice. I mean, I don't think anybody couldn't help but notice. Do you get what you want when you wanted it? <laughs> I mean, Jackson and Seagal, they both have a very nice uh, chemistry in this movie that, you know, here again, I think a lot of, people watching this movie will obviously have very different opinions on, you know, whether they want this relationship to succeed or not. 
And, um, you know, I kind of knew going in already what uh, even never seen this before that it wasn't going to end on a very happy note, even though romantic comedies tend to do that. I mean, you know, couples in romantic comedies, they always have to go through a series of, you know, misunderstandings or, or uh, you know, issues that will eventually keep them apart. And with this film, of course, it's, you know, it's obvious from the get go that there is, you know, you know, he's married, he has a wife, you know, there are children on both sides of the aisle. And of course, you know, they have to deal with babysitters and all this other stuff just so they could have this uh, hot and heavy affair. But, you know, they have a number of arguments in this movie. And, you know, they're very realistically done. You know, they are very funny. They are very amusing. But ultimately, I think that Melvin Frank and his co-writer knew that when they were writing this, that, you know, hey, I mean, this, the, this is never, ever going to be consummated. This relationship is never going to be uh, fully consummated, no matter how much you like the actors and no matter how much you want this relationship to succeed. Uh, because it's kind of a kind of a fruitless endeavor, to be perfectly honest. And he goes on this rant about being typically American. Do anything typically like that goes for humping too. <laughs> and he actually drops the uh, the daughters of the American Revolution, which I was not expecting that. Uh, I honestly was not expecting that at all. <laughs> Just to let everybody know, I actually, uh, when I was growing up, my mother was in the Daughters of the American Revolution, and so I was in uh, Children of the American Revolution, which was, of course, the offspring of uh, D.A.R. Uh, we called it C.A.R. Yeah. Struck out in the sack is, I assume, a mixed metaphor, undoubtedly American and perpetually nasty. <laughs> Glenda Jackson has some sharp lines in this movie. She really does have some sharp moments. And, and here again, I mean, her reactions to different, uh, to in many of these scenes, I think are just, you know, wonderful. Here again, it's not the performance. I like the performance. I like Glenda Jackson. I just think that they should have given the Oscar to somebody else. Simply because Glenda Jackson had already won for uh, Women in Love four years prior to this. But yeah, she clearly has a gift for uh, comedy in this movie. And of course, she would end up doing a lot uh, more comedies after this. And as Lily Tomlin in 9 to 5 would say, we're going to need a locker for the hat. <laughs> Now, see, here we have the golfing sequence where, you know, <laughs> I mean, okay, look, on one hand, you could take the golfing as being a perfect cover for the affair because like, okay, granted, they're not back in London right now, but that would be a perfect cover for it. Oh yeah, honey, I'm just going to go play golf, you know? <laughs> But he ends up playing against this uh, this uh, Spanish boy who's who's actually very funny, and uh, <laughs> the way this builds up is pretty good. Where he decides to do a little gambling with the kid, and of course she's kind of exasperated by this. Like, really, you're gonna you're gonna gamble with this kid, you know, and everything, you know? Oh yeah, well, you know, it'll be like it'll be like tipping him, you know. I mean, you know, if he wins, you know. <laughs> And, but it's also in this scene that we realize that George Seagal is not, you know, that much of a, not that much of a prick, you know, he's, you know, he actually, you know, he actually near the end, he doesn't have any intention of ripping off this kid, no matter how much more decide to, uh, you know, bet on the kid, because like I said, his friends start to join in on the, uh, on the uh, bets and then his cousin's friends and everything. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, this entire golfing sequence is actually very, very funny. Oh, yeah, that's the kid's name is uh, Enrique. And uh... 
<laughs> nice shot. <laughs> he says like nice shot like three times in a row. <laughs> Try and stay off the green, will you? <laughs> Now, eventually, you're going to see more kids uh, come into the front. There, there they are right there. It's like, well, my cousins like to bet on me. Oh, your cousins? <laughs> see, yeah. 100, 100, 100, starting from here, yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's bad enough that he's gambling with this one kid, but then he has his, but then the kid's friends want to get in on the action, too. It's like... <laughs> That's <laughs> who more and more kids just start following them around on the golf course to make bets. <laughs> Your cousin's friends would like to bet on you. Like, what? <laughs> okay, kid. <laughs> it's like the whole gang is there. <laughs> hey, senor, my cousin's friend's cousins would like to bet on me. Get out the way you got in. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, hey, I mean, they're, they're showing support for their buddy, which is, you know, pretty fun. And <laughs> you actually you do kind of hope that the kids do win. But uh, as we will eventually find out, they do not. Uh, they do lose, in fact, against uh, George Siegel. Mm. Now, let's see here. Uh, so... Let's talk a bit more about Glenda Jackson. Okay. I mean, after all, she won the Oscar for this uh, movie. I think it'd be uh, appropriate to give her a bit uh, a huge spotlight here, even though I, I'm kind of waiting for the scene to end just because it's too funny. <laughs> yeah, they're all, they're all helping him out, <laughs> coaching him. They're like, okay, no, you can beat this guy. You can do it. You can do it. And as you will see, he does not get it. And George Siegel ends up winning the golf game, and she is exasperated and leaves, understandably. Uh, but as uh, George Siegel showcases right here, he's not going to be a uh, total cad and just take all the money. Uh, he's going to let them keep all the money, which, you know, is very magnanimous of him. You know, he didn't... You know, you know, he realized, you know, I'm not going to rip off a bunch of kids. I'm just not going to do it, you know. And so he says, you know, just keep the money, you know, do with it what you uh, would like to do with it. But, um, okay, so let's talk more about Glenda Jackson here. These, all oh, these glasses. Uh, they're not doing her any favors, I think. But, oh, yeah, and we have all this comedy about the fact that he just can't drive this car. You can't, you know, he, he can't put it in the right uh, stick or shift position or whatever. Yeah, always good for laughs right here. But uh, Glenda Jackson was born on May 9th, 1936. Her mother named her after the Hollywood film star Glenda Farrell. And shortly after her birth, the family moved to Hoy Lake in the world. Glenda's family, uh, family were very poor and uh, lived in a two-up, two-down house at 21 Lake Place with an outside toilet. Her father, Harry, was a builder. Her mother, Joan, worked on the local supermarket checkout, pulled prints in a, pulled pints in a pub, and was a domestic cleaner. Uh, Glenda Jackson was the oldest of four daughters, was educated at Holy Trinity Church of England and Carth, uh, Cathcart Street Primary Schools. She made her first acting appearance in J.B. Priestley's Mystery of Green Fingers in 1952, for the YMCA players in Hoy Lake. She worked for two years in Boots, the chemists, before winning a scholarship in 1954 to study at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London. 
and then she moved uh, to the capital to begin course in early 1955. In January of 1957, she made her professional stage debut in Ted Willis's Doctor in the House at the uh, Connaught Theater in Worthing. This was followed by Terrence Radigan's Separate Tables while Jackson was still at RADA, and she began appearing in repertory theater. She was also a stage manager at Crew uh, from 1958 to 61. Jackson went through a period of two and a half years in which she was unable to find acting work. She unsuccessfully auditioned for the Royal Shakespeare Company and undertook what she later described as a, quote, series of soul-destroying jobs. This included waitressing at the tw at the Two Eyes Coffee Bar, clerical work for the large city of London firm, answering phones for a the theatrical agent, and a role at British home stores. She also worked as a blue coat at Butlin's Paheli Holiday Resort on the Lillian Peninsula in Northwest Wales, where her new husband and fellow actor Roy Hodges was a redcoat. Jackson eventually returned to repertory theater in Dundee, but worked in bars in between acting jobs. She made her film debut in a bit part in the kitchen sink drama This Sporting Life in 1963. Now, This Sporting Life was directed by Lindsay Anderson. And in fact, in 1973, the same year as uh, A Touch of Class, um, Lindsay Anderson directed a movie called Oh Lucky Man, which also happens to be one of my top five favorite movies of all time. Uh, it's a movie starring Malcolm McDowell, second part of a trilogy. And uh, I am so looking forward to doing a commentary on that later in the year. Uh, but The Sporting Life, uh, based on the 1960 novel of the same name by David Story, which won the 1960 Macmillan Fiction Award, and it recounts the story of a rugby league footballer in Wakefield, a mining city in Yorkshire, whose romantic life is not as successful as his sporting life. Story, a professional professional rugby league footballer, also wrote wrote the screenplay, and the film also stars Richard Harris, Rachel Roberts, William Hartnell, and Alan Bedell. The film was Harris's first starring role and won him the Best Actor Award at the 1963 Cannes Film Festival. A uh, member of the RSC for four years from 1963, Glenda Jackson were originally joined for director Peter Brooks' Theater of Cruelty season, which included Peter Weiss's Marat Saad, where she played an inmate of an insane asylum, uh, portraying Sh uh, Charlotte Corday, the assassin of Jean-Paul Marat. Now, I have never seen Marat Saad before, uh, the film version, it came out in, uh, I believe, 1965. But it's considered one of the like the great films of uh, 1960s uh, cinema by many uh, film scholars. Mary, Queen of Scots, premiered in December of 1971 in L.A. and was the 1972 Royal Film Performance in Britain, attended by the Queen Mother. Oh, actually, just to backtrack a little bit. Um, her first starring role was actually in Women in Love, which got her the Academy Award in 1969. Uh, Brian McFarlane, the main author of the Encyclopedia of British Film, wrote, quote, her blazing intelligence, sexual challenge, and abrasiveness were at the service of a superbly written role in a film with a passion rare in the annals of British cinema. In the process of gaining funding for the music lovers from United Artists, Ken Russell explained it as a story of a homosexual who marries a nymphomaniac, the couple being the composer Pyat Illich Tchaikovsky, played by Richard Chamberlain, and Antonia Milakova, played by Jackson. That's the movie The Music Lovers, which came out in 1970, right after Women in Love. Their performances are more dramatically bombastic than sympathetic or sometimes even believable. The Music Lovers was a box office success in Europe, reaching number one in the UK weekly rankings in March of 71. And it was the first of four films starring Glenda Jackson, which would top the box office charts in her native country. 
Jackson was initially interested in the role of Sister Jean in The Devils, uh, Russell's next film, but turned it down after script rewrites and deciding that she did not wish to play a third neurotic character in a row. Jackson had her head shaved to play Queen Elizabeth I in the BBC serial Elizabeth R in 1971. After the series aired on PBS in the U.S., she received two Primetime Emmy Awards for her performance. She also played Queen Elizabeth in the film Mary, Queen of Scots, gained an Academy Award nomination and a BAFTA Award for her role in John Schlesinger's Sunday, Bloody Sunday, both in 1971. And uh, Sunday, Bloody Sunday, it was a story of a free-spirited young bisexual artist and his simultaneous relationships with a divorced recruitment consultant, played by Jackson, and a gay Jewish doctor, played by Peter Finch. And uh, in July, Sunday's Bloody Sunday topped the UK box office charts for two weeks. That year, British exhibitors voted her the sixth most popular star at the British box office. Jackson's popularity was such that 1971 saw her receive Best Film Actress Awards from the Variety Club of Great Britain, who also awarded her similarly in 1975 and 78, the New York Film Critics and the U.S. National Society of Film Critics. Mary Queen of Scots was premiered in December of 71 in Los Angeles. The film reached number one in the U.K. box office charts in April of that year, a position it held for five consecutive weeks. Jackson made the first of several appearances with Morikambi and Wise in their 1971 Christmas special. Appearing in a comedy sketch as Cleopatra, she delivered the line, All men are fools, and what makes them so is having beauty like what I have got. Her later appearances included a song and dance routine where she was pushed off stage, a period drama about Queen Victoria, and another musical routine where she was elevated 10 feet in the air by a misbehaving swivel chair. Jackson and Wise also appeared in a 1981 information film for the Blood Transfusion Service. Now, uh, the director of, a, of um, a Touch of Class, Melvin Frank, he saw Jackson's comedy skills on the Morikambi and Wise show and offered her the lead female role in this romantic comedy with George Siegel, which was... Uh, Number one at the box office yet again in the United Kingdom when it opened in June of 1973. In February of 74, her role in the film won her the Academy Award for Best Actress. After that, she continued to work in the theater, returning to the RSC for the lead in Ibsen's Hedda Gabler. A later film version directed by Trevor Nunn was released as Hedda, 1975, for which she was nominated for her final Oscar. In, New York, uh, in the New York Times, Vincent Camby wrote, This version of Hedda Gabler is all Miss Jackson's Hedda, and I must say, great fun to watch. Miss Jackson's technical virtuosity is particularly suited to a character like Hedda. Her command of her voice and her body, as well as the Jackson mannerisms, have the effect of separating the actress from the character in a very curious way. Oh, Zachary Antle, always great. Uh, it's all right. It's all right. Just to let... Uh, let me uh, get a timestamp real quick. We are approximately one hour, three minutes, and 30 seconds. One hour, three, and 30 seconds, or one hour and four minutes. If you're going to jump ahead and you can meet, um, that's where we are in the film right now, where they're both uh, fighting in the hotel room. <laughs> and um, oh, what was his name again? The uh, hotel manager. Uh, Nadim Sawala, you know, caught in the middle of their little uh, their little battle here, which was uh, very funny. God, I love women in love so much. It's just the kind of weird, arty, but still totally followable movie I want to make uh, <laughs> someday. Yeah, I really liked Women in Love. I mean, I can't say I want to buy it because it's available on Criterion and everything. Oh, now here is the most famous line in. The movie, which I'm not sure would fly today, but um, here it is. For God's sake, my one chance to be raped and you can't get your bloody trousers off. Now, I got to admit when I first heard the line, I was a little uh, shocked by it. But then they started laughing and it's like, oh, okay. That gives the audience permission to laugh 
at that line. But I still wonder in you know today's world with Me Too and everything, would that line still fly? Would people still find that funny? In the context of this movie, I actually think it's funny. But here again, I don't think you can get away with uh, delivering a line like that now. Um, that's just me though, but I don't know. Let me know what you think, because that is the most famous line in this movie of, uh, a touch of class is when she, uh, complains about him not getting his trousers off. <laughs> oh, I love Sunday, bloody Sunday. Yep. Yep. I I've never seen it personally. I probably should. Uh, cause like I said, before I watched uh, touch of class, the only, uh, the only Glenda Jackson movie I had watched before was Hopscotch with um, Walter Matthau, which also got a Criterion release. Hmm. In 1978, she scored box office success in the United States in the romantic comedy House Calls, also starring Walter Matthau. Uh, it was the biggest box office hit of her career in the United States. And that year, she was awarded a CBE in 1979, she reunited with her touch of class colleagues, Siegel and Frank, for the romantic comedy Lost and Found. And yes, it is very true that director Melvin Frank, uh, his co writer Jack Rose, and George Siegel and Glenda Jackson, and Paul Sorvino, they all reunited to do a 1979 movie which nobody remembers called Lost and Found. And the reason why nobody remembers it is because of the fact that it was a bomb at the box office. Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times gave the film one star out of four and, and said, this movie is terrible. It's awful. It is inconceivable to me that the same people who made a touch of class had anything to do with it, but they did. Janet Maslin of the New York Times wrote, Lost and Found is reasonably breezy, but has neither authenticity nor glamour. Instead, it settles for a hominess that borders on the drab. If Mr. Siegel and Miss Jackson weren't one of those fabulous couples, one can never quite believe are made of flesh and blood. Neither are they plausible as just plain folks who are happily in love. The script insists on, upon a strong sexual bond between them, but neither performance suggests any such thing. The characters inflict a lot of pain upon each other, which makes it even harder to see what keeps them together. Variety called the film a pleasant enough romantic comedy that manages to evoke laughter more often than not, though in comparison to a touch of class, the new picture has neither the charm nor the style of the 1973 picture, depending too much on forced physical comedy. Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune gave the film two stars out of four and wrote, Unfortunately, the biggest problem with Lost and Found is that George Siegel's character simply is not worth Jackson's attention. Within the world of this trivial comedy, Siegel is presented as cute when actually he is a menace. A menace to himself and to any woman who place her trust in him. Jackson's character recognizes this, but the quote-unquote cute script doesn't allow her to walk away permanently. And finally, Charles Champlin of the Los Angeles Times was also negative when he wrote, when the romantic comedy can't make its make-believe believable, the results, hinting of beads of perspiration on the brow and cigarette butts beside the typewriter in the cold gray dawn, are more likely to make the teeth ache. And the elusive binding ingredient is uh, is charm. Miss Jackson can speak rapid-fire scorn as well as any actress working, and in full wrath she is wonderful to behold, but lost and found is a lost cause. I also like Glenda because she's kind of like Charlotte Gainsbourg. Yeah. 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 I can definitely see that. They're both not pretty, but very good looking women and super watchable and gutsy as of actors too, which I really appreciate. Yeah. I agree with that. I, I mean, I can't believe I never made that connection before, but yeah. Uh, Glenda Jackson, you know, he, she does have a slight resemblance to, Charlotte Gainsbourg, but I think they also have kind of have similar acting styles as well. Yeah, good call. Good call, Zach. I didn't notice that. Huh. And like I said, one more time, we are one hour and 10 minutes, one hour and 10 minutes into a touch of class. 
And we have approximately 36 minutes left to go. Mm. Let's see. <clears throat> And there's Paul, Paul, Paul Sorvino again. <laughs> Fifteen years after the New York engagement of Marat Saad, Jackson returned to Broadway in Andrew Davies' Rose opposite Jessica Tandy. Both actresses received Tony nominations for their roles. In September of 1983, the Glenda Jackson Theater in Birkenhead was named in her honor. The theater was attached to Rural Metropolitan College, but demolished in 2005 following the establishment of a purpose-built site for students. Hmm. In 1985, she appeared as Nina Leeds in a revival of Eugene O'Neill's Strange Interlude at the Netherlander Theater in a production which had originated in London the previous year and ran for eight weeks. John Bo Beaufort for the Christian Science Monitor wrote, Bravura is the inevitable word for Miss Jackson's display of feminine wiles and brilliant technique frank rich in the new york times thought jackson with her helmet of hair and gashed features when leads as a young woman quote looks like a cubist portrait of louise brooks i thought of louise brooks too to be perfectly honest and later when the characters aged several decades is mesmerizing as a zelda fitzgerald-esque neurotic a rotting and spiteful middle-aged matron, and finally a spent, sphinx-like widow, happily embracing extinction. Herbert Wise directed a British television version of O'Neill's drama, which was first broadcast in the U.S. as part of PBS's American Playhouse in January of 1988. In November of 1984, Jackson appeared in the title role of Robert David McDonald's English translation of Racine's Fadir, titled Fedra, at the Old Vic. The play was designed and directed by Philip Prowse and Robert Edison playing Thera Means. The Daily Telegraph's John Barber wrote of her performance, wonderfully impressive. The actress finds a voice as jagged and horses her torment. Benedict Nightingale, in The New Statesman, was intrigued that Jackson didn't go for nobility, but played Racine's feverish queen as if to say that being skewered in the guts by Cupid is an ugly, bitter, humiliating business. The costume which Prowse designed for Jackson's performance is the Victoria and Albert Museum, and iconic photographs of Jackson in the role can be found online. In 1989, Jackson appeared in Ken Russell's The Rainbow, Rainbow uh, which is actually the book that uh, D.H. Lawrence published before Women in Love. I think Women in Love is like a quasi-sequel to The Rainbow where she played Anna Brangwen, mother of Gudrun, the part for which she had won her first Academy Award 20 years earlier. The same year, she played Martha in a Los Angeles production of Edward Albee's Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf at the Doolittle Theater, now the Ricardo Montalban Theater. Oh. Directed by the playwright himself, this staging featured John Lithgow as George. Dan Sullivan in the Los Angeles Times wrote that Jackson and Lithgow performed, quote, with the assurance of dedicated character assassins, not your higher and higher and salary types, with the actors being able to display their character's capacity for antipathy. Albee was disappointed with this production, pointing to Jackson, who he thought, quote, had retreated back to the thing she can do very well, that ice-cold performance. I don't know whether she got scared, but in rehearsal she was being Martha, and the closer we got to opening, the less Martha she was. She performed the lead role in Howard Barker's Scenes from an Execution as Galactia, a 16th century female Venetian artist at the Alameda Theater in 1990. It was an adaptation of Barker's 1984 radio play in which Jackson had played the same role. In 2015, Jackson returned to acting following a 23-year absence, having retired from politics. She took the role of Deed, the ancient matriarch, in a series of Radio 4 plays, Blood, Sex, and Money, based on a series of books, novels by Emil Zola. She returned to the stage at the end of 2016, playing the title role in William Shakespeare's King Lear. 
at the Old Vic Theater in London in a production running from October 25th to the 3rd of December. Jackson was nominated for Best Actress at the Olivier Awards for a role, but ultimately lost out to Billy Piper, of all people. Remember that uh, British show Secret Diary of a Call Girl? Yeah, that was Billy Piper. She did, however, win the Natasha Richardson Award for Best Actress at the 2017 Evening Standard Theater Awards for her performance. Dominique Cavendish of The Telegraph wrote, Glenda Jackson is tremendous as King Lear. No, no ifs, no buts in returning to the stage at the age of 80. 25 years after her last performance as the Clytemestra-like Christine in Eugene O'Neill's Morning Becomes Electra at the Glasgow Citizens. She has pulled off one of those 11-hour feats of human endeavor that will surely be talked about for years to come by those who see it. In 2018, Jackson returned to Broadway in a revival of Edward Albee's Three Tall Women, winning the 2018 Tony Award for Best Actress in a Play. Damn. Marin, Marilyn Stasio of Variety wrote, Watching Glenda Jackson in a, in a theatrical flight is like looking straight into the sun. Her expressive face registers her thoughts while guarding her feelings, but it's the voice that really thrills. Deeply pitched and clarion clear, it's the commanding voice of stern authority. Don't mess with this household god, or she'll turn you to stone. Jackson returned to the role of King Lear on Broadway in a production that opened in April of 2019. Director Sam Gold describes her portrayal of Lear in the New York Times Magazine, quote, she is going to go through something most people don't go through. You're all invited. Glenda Jackson is going to endure this, and you're going to witness it. In 2019, after a 27-year absence, Jackson returned to television drama, playing an elderly grandmother struggling with dementia in Elizabeth is Missing on BBC One, based on the novel of the same name by Emma Healy, for which she won the BAFTA TV Award for Best Actress and International Emmy Award for Best Actress. The woman is 84, and she's winning all these awards left and right. It's insane. It was reported in February of 2021 that Jackson would co-star with Michael Caine in The Great Escaper, a film telling the true story of Bernard Jordan's escape from his care home to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the D-Day landings in France. Caine will play Jordan with Jackson as, as his wife, Irene. Caine and Jackson previously, previously starred together in the movie The Romantic English Woman, in 1976. Mm -hmm. In July of 2022, the British Film Institute celebrated her film and television career with a month-long retrospective season at the BFI South Bank in London. As well as screenings of her work, the program included Jen Clenda Jackson in Conversation, in which she was interviewed about her career live on stage by broadcaster John Wilson. Wow. Very, very impressive. Very, very impressive. I mean, she's still kicking ass, still kicking ass, uh, winning awards left and right in her 80s. That's just unbelievable. Uh, I heard back in the 70s, Jackson really wanted the Faye Dunaway character in Network, but for some reason, I can't imagine her in that role. I can't imagine her in that role either. Uh, to be honest, I, per I, I just can't. Uh, Glenda is kind of like Louise, but I will say I think her hairdo in this movie looks stylish as hell. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I, I, I love her hair in this movie, absolutely. And I've loved Charlotte ever since I started watching Lars von Trier movies. <laughs> oh, and going back to Bond, they looked at Jackson to play M before they got Judy Dench, and I can definitely imagine that. Wow. You know what? Yeah, I can definitely see that as well. I mean, Judy Dench is a little bit more... I think known to American audiences and Glenda Jackson is particularly now. Um, but yeah. Wow. But yeah. She, I think she would have made a hell of an M. I, I honestly think she would have made a hell of an M. Mm -hmm. Now for many, many years in the 1980s and 1990s, she was uh, um, 
in politics. I mean, she uh, joined the Labor Party in the, her early in the early 1950s at the age of 16. Uh, she and uh, and she retired from acting in 1991 in order to devote herself to politics full time as the prospective parliamentary candidate for Hampstead and Highgate. Although her party did not win the 1992 general election, as had been speculated, there was an above average swing to labor in her constituency, and she gained the seat narrowly beating the conservative candidate Oliver Letwin, a former advisor to Prime Minister. Margaret Thatcher. Jackson, whose campaign had been sponsored by the Train Drivers Union, was the first of Labor's 1992 intake to join the front bench when she became Shadow Transport Minister in July of 1996. Following Labor's landslide victory in the 1997 general election, which saw her comfortably re-elected, she was appointed as a junior minister in the government of Prime Minister Tony Blair, with the responsibility for transport in London. She resigned from the post in 1999 before an unsuccessful attempt to be nominated as the Labour candidate for the election of the first mayor of London in 2000. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so yeah, that's a little bit about her political career. And uh, yeah, that's about it. That's about it that I'm going to, I think I'm going to end it there. I mean, here again, I, I mean, I can imagine that she's still going to be acting well into her 90s. Yeah. Oh, I've seen videos of her in Parliament. She's a powerhouse and hilarious to boot, but who, but who doesn't like watching stuffy Brits scream at each other across a room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, we got about 24 minutes left. We are coming up on the hour and 22 minute mark, the one hour, 22 minute mark of a touch of class. Now, I don't know whether we pass it or not, but at some point they, um, both George Siegel and Glenda Jackson watched the uh, 1946 classic Brief Encounter, uh, which was actually about two uh, people in London who are married and they have an affair. A uh, very controversial movie for the time. Yeah, Brief Encounter was a 1945 uh, romantic drama directed by David Lean with a screenplay by Noel Coward based on his 1936 one-act play Still Life. And it follows a passionate extramarital affair in England shortly before World War II. The protagonist is Laura, a married woman with children, whose conventional life becomes increasingly complicated after a chance meeting at a railway station with a married stranger with whom she subsequently falls in love. And uh, many critics, historians, and scholars cite the film as one of the greatest of all time. In 1999, the British Film Institute ranked it the second greatest British film of all time, and in 2017, a timeout poll of 150 actors, directors, writers, producers, and critics ranked it the 12th best British film ever. Now, I, I, this is pretty much the moment where, <clears throat> where things really start to crack and you realize, yeah, th there's this bit, there's no dialogue. There's no dialogue in the scene whatsoever. But, you know, she's trying to find somebody else to spend time with that night because she's already have everything cooked and ready to go. And he just, you know, he buys some flowers down there at the corner and brings them up. And <laughs> it's like, OK, you start leaving your dog at the wrong apartment. Then you bring the flowers up to the wrong apartment, too. <laughs> I mean. Sooner or later, this is going to have to end. This is going to have to end, whether it's uh, you having the balls to go to your wife and say, I want a divorce, or uh, <laughs> or it's just going to end and you're never going to see Glenda Jackson again. And uh, the thing is, is that, I mean, there were a lot of people at the time, including Siskel and Ebert, who... Uh, were very disappointed by the end, even though they were generally positive with uh, 
a touch of class. I mean, most of the critics were actually genuine, were actually generally positive when it came to their reactions. But um, but at the same time, I think they uh, stopped short of calling it like one of the uh, one of the best films of the year, even though the Academy uh, fell in love with it. But um, the film, it did, uh, you know, 16.8 million in 1973, which is pretty good. Um, now, Roger Ebert gave the film three stars out of four, calling it, quote, a sharp-edged, often very funny dissection of a love affair between two possibly incompatible people. But then it gets serious with itself and ends on a note that doesn't satisfy us. Gene Siskel had a similar opinion, awarding two and a half star stars out of four and writing in the film's best moments. It reminds one of those wonderful screen battles between Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn. But then it tries to get serious, and which leads to an unsatisfying conclusion totally removed from the dominant tone of the movie, which is a raucous at best, contrived silliness at worst. Vincent Camby of the New York Times called it a very patchy movie, enormously funny in bits and pieces and sometimes downright dumb. <laughs> Variety wrote George Siegel herein justifies superbly a reputation for comedy ability, while Glenda Jackson's full-spectrum talent is again confirmed. Penelope Gallat of the New Yorker wrote that the film had, quote, moments of reckless funniness, but observed that the middle of period convention is odd as it blended the Hepburn Tracy tradition and an old style slapstick scene with modern and naturalistic eroticism. Sylvia Miller of the monthly film Bolton called the film a waste of two considerable talents saying that Melvin Frank had written a script, which is not devoid of wit, but it's never effortless and a battering of course, of course, sexual polemic is always thrusting in to spoil the fun. The film has an 85% uh, score on Rotten Tomatoes. And uh, George Siegel and Glenda Jackson also won the uh, Golden Globe Awards for Best Actor and Best Actress, while there were also nominations for Best Motion Picture, Screenplay, and Original Song. Here again, I've said it before, I think the music is absolutely, without a doubt, the weakest element uh, in this movie. Uh, but Melvin Frank and Jack Rose also won the uh, British, uh, Best British Screenplay, Best British Original Screenplay, and Best British Comedy Screenplay from the Writers Guild of Great Britain Awards. And they also won the Writers Guild of America Award for Best Comedy Written Directly for the Screen. Then again, imagine being Glenda opponent in Parliament, but also thinking, I saw your boobs in a movie before. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know, I have to say, of the uh, two films which Glenda Jackson won Oscars for, I prefer her performance here but I prefer Women in Love as a movie. I think that, um, you know, here again, I I, th I, I I understand why she won both Oscars. I just think that, you know, here again, I think they should have just given it to somebody else in 1973 just to, you know, let somebody else take the spotlight rather than, you know, the fact that she already won before. But that's just me. <laughs> I mean, Ellen Burstein for The Exorcist would have been, a, um, you know, a very worthy winner that year. But, you know, hey, I mean, I also liked Marsha Mason and Cinderella Liberty, you know. And we'll talk about Cinderella Liberty in December when I do that one. But um, well, actually, November. I'm going to do that and the last detail around Veterans Day in um, November because they're both actually based on the same author, uh, books by the same author. <laughs> we can't do this. I got to be at the Albert Hall listening to Beethoven. <laughs> oh, Beethoven won't mind. <laughs> yes. 
It's like, how long does this have to go on for where he has to, you know, disappear for, you know, you know, a half hour or so every day just to uh, have this, uh, have this affair. But, um, <laughs> uh, I mean, was I disappointed by the ending to a touch of class? Not really. I think it actually ended the way it probably should have ended. I think actually think the ending was very appropriate. Is it satisfying? That's another question. I mean, here's the weird thing. Would I recommend a touch of class? Yes, I would. I think it's a a really good romantic comedy that I I just think it suffers from being just a little bit dated. Uh, I, like I said, I think the music is atrocious. And, you know, like I said, with most romantic comedies, audiences want to see the couple to be together at the end. Okay, I'm just saying that's, you know, it's kind of a rule for the genre. <clears throat> Oh, this is very, I, I love this moment. The, the, this moment I laughed out loud at when he, you know, is, yeah, I'm going to lunch. Okay. So was, is it uh, one of the long ones or one of the short ones? Oh, so it's one of the long ones. Oh, okay. I get it. <laughs> it's, <laughs> and what happens? She calls and canceled their lunch rendezvous. <laughs> and uh, who plays this guy? Who plays this guy real quick as the assistant? Is that um might be might be Michael Elwin, who is in Doctor Who. But um, like I said, some of these lines are too funny for words because you know, at first he asks about the lunch date. So is it uh, one of the long ones or one of the short ones? Uh, she has to call to cancel because she's too busy. And then he uh, says to him, uh, okay, will you get me a sandwich from the quarter? And he says, uh, one of the long ones or one of the short ones? <laughs> like, that made me laugh out loud. I mean, th there is more than enough comedy in this movie. Some of it's silly. Some of it is silly. But I do think that there is more than enough comedy in this movie to justify watching it. Here again, I do think people will be disappointed by the ending. And I do think that people here again will have, you know, depending upon their, you know, their own views on marriage and affairs and everything and adultery, uh, how they feel about these characters and everything. But uh, the, the truth of the matter is, I think it's overall a solid romantic comedy. Far from perfect, but it is, you know, the performances are well done. The writing is really, really good. And I do think that it works more often than not uh, as a romantic comedy. Uh, I just think that it it's far from being one of the best of the genre. And here again, I don't think it's one of the best films of 73. I, The Academy disagreed, but I mean, I would not put this in a top 11 for the year. I, I just, I, I wouldn't do it. It's close, but not quite. I just love Women in Love because it has so many artsy and strange filmmaking tricks. Yes, that make me drool every time I see it. Plus, it feels super modern for how old it is. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. I mean, I, I here again, I, I prefer Women in Love as a film over Touch of Class. But I prefer Glenda's performance here, which I know is odd. But yeah, I mean, I really lo lo like Glenda Jackson's performance. Like I said, I just think they should have given the Oscar to somebody else. You know, somebody else just for giving somebody else the chance to win as opposed to, you know. I'm also surprised the chick who played the sister in it wasn't a bigger star too. I thought she was excellent also. Oh. Sister. Oh, Julia? Yeah. She's played by uh, Lisa Vanderpump. Wow. Um, 
From 2010 to 2019, she was an original main cast member on The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. And in 2021, she hosted Overserved with Lisa Vanderpump. Later that year, she was featured in Vanderpump Dogs. She and her husband have owned 36 restaurants, bars, and clubs across the United Kingdom and the United States, including the Shadow Lounge, the Bar Soho, the Sur Restaurant and Lounge, the Villa Blanca, the Pump Restaurant, the Tom Tom Restaurant, Vanderpump Cocktail Garden, and Vanderpump A Paris. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> this was her first film. She was uncredited, but yeah, this was her first film. She also later appeared in Tommy and Bugsy Malone and the Wildcats of St. Trinian's. Oh, the sister and women in love. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. That was... Uh, Jenny Linden. Yeah, Jenny Linden. Mm -hmm. Also a, uh, a graduate of Doctor Who. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. So let me see. I think that's about it for a touch of class in terms of, uh, well, actually, there's one more thing I can check. We um, we got about less than 10 minutes here left to go for the movie. Uh, do, 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 do. Look at this real quick. The black and white film. No, no, not that. I've already mentioned that. <laughs> the only Best Picture Oscar nominee that year to, be, to not be nominated for Best Director. Mm -hmm. Actor David DeKaiser played dual roles in this movie. He plays both the doctor at the Spanish Hotel and also voices the voice of a disc jockey on the radio at the hotel. You know? Oh, yes. Uh, one more thing that we need to talk about is Melvin Frank. I didn't mention all the movies that he worked on, but uh, he, along with his uh, partner... Uh, they actually wrote movies for Bob Hope and Milton Berle, as well as for their radio shows. Yeah, his partnership with Norman Panama. They worked on films like Mr. Blanding's Builds His Dream House, White Christmas, and The Court Jester. Yep. Uh, and they also did movies like Road to Utopia, uh, The Reformer and The Redhead. Uh, above and Beyond, Knock on Wood. And then in 1966, uh, they did a movie called, uh, based on the play, uh, A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, directed by Richard Lester. And I think that before A Touch of Class, that was the only other movie that I, I've seen that uh, Melvin uh, Frank was involved in. Well, aside from White Christmas, but then again, I'm not really a fan of White Christmas. <laughs> uh, after A Touch of Class, he directed uh, The Prisoner of Second Avenue, starring Jack Lemmon and Anne Bancroft, based on the uh, Neil Simon play, and uh, also did The Duchess and the Dirtwater Fox, which I mentioned before, uh, which reunited him with George Siegel, as well as uh, Goldie Hawn was also in that movie. And it's about an 1880s dance hall girl from San Francisco who steals a satchel of ill-gotten money as part of her plan to change her identity into an English governess and get a job with a wealthy family in Utah. She then has to elude the former owners of the money, the Bloodworth Gang, on a cross-country chase. That actually sounds kind of fun. <laughs> then after that, she uh, he did Lost and Found, which, like I said, bombed. And his last movie, I'd never heard of this before, but it came out in 1987. It came out a year before he died. Uh, you know, he had 
heart surgery, and then he died uh, a day later. But he directed this 1987 film called Walk Like a Man, starring Howie Mandel, Christopher Lloyd, Cloris Leachman, and also Amy Steele, the star of uh, Friday the 13th Part 2. And the plot concerns a young man who finally returns to his high society family after having been raised by wolves. No, that's the plot. <laughs> He's raised by wolves in the uh, in the wintry uh, Klondike wilderness. <laughs> Played by Howie Mandel, of all people. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, but the movie was a complete a complete bomb. It didn't even make five hundred thousand dollars at the uh, at in theaters. And um, yeah, I've never seen it on TV. I've never even heard of it until now. But uh, sadly, sadly, that was the last film that Melvin Frank directed. Although uh, his daughter uh, in 1986 actually won a Pulitzer Prize. Yeah, Elizabeth Frank. She uh, won a Pulitzer Prize for biogra biography or autobiography for Louise Bogan, a portrait in 1985. And Louise Bogan was a uh, American poet. She was appointed the fourth uh, poet laureate uh, to the Library of Congress in 1945 and was the first woman to hold this title. Throughout her life, she wrote poetry, fiction, and criticism, became the regular poetry reviewer for The New Yorker. So, um, and his daughter, Elizabeth Frank, is still alive. She's uh, 77, and uh, she's uh, the Joseph E. Harry Professor of Modern Languages and Literature at, uh, oh, and she's also written numerous articles on literature and art in such publications as the New York Times Book Review, the Nation, Art in America, Partisan Review, and Art News. And she's also published short stories in translation by Bulgarian author Zaratka Ivitmova in the Bulgarian journal Sovereignik. Okay. So, yeah, she's still very much active in the uh, literary world. But uh, Melvin Frank passed away at the age of 75 in 1988. And... Um, I got to check out The Court Jester. I've been meaning to check that one out for a while. That It has Angela Lansbury and Glynis Johns and uh, uh, Basil Rathbone and Danny Kaye, who I got to confess, I, I, I couldn't stand Danny Kaye. And uh, what was that one movie he did that got remade by Ben Stiller, uh, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty? Yeah, I couldn't stand him in that movie. And uh, I think it kind of put me off any other movie with Danny Kaye in it. But uh, at the very least, I got to check out The Court Jester. And um, I'm actually interested in that Duchess and the Dirtwater Fox with uh, George Siegel and uh, Goldie Hawn now. That actually sounds really interesting. Speaking of British actresses from this time, I'm surprised Diana Rigg was never up for an Oscar. You know, I... Uh, she, Diana Rigg, her last movie was uh, Edgar Wright's uh, Last Night in Soho. And I was really, really hoping she would have gotten a uh, a uh, Oscar nomination or even a BAFTA nomination for that. But no, she didn't, um, po posthumously or otherwise. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I, 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 Last Night in Soho, by the way, that was my absolute favorite movie of 2021 yeah i think edgar wright really uh you know he was two for two for that year with uh last night in soho and uh and uh the sparks brothers so uh here we have the ending of the movie of a touch of class where um you know the uh the telegram that he sent out and he uh tried to uh you know, try to cancel it. It didn't cancel. She ended up getting it and realized, you know, yeah, it's time to end. It's time to end the affair, you know, end things cleanly. He's going to be going back to his wife and she's going to be free again to do whatever she wants to do. But it has this uh, cute little moment, which alludes to when they first met, when they got the cab together, you know, you want to, you want to share a ride. And so she, you know, she bumps into another man 
who asked her, hey, you want to share the ride? And she asked him, are you married? And uh, she, he says, yes. And uh, she's like, okay, you can have this one. I'll just, uh, I'll just keep going. So, <laughs> yeah. But you know what? I mean, look, I mean, you know, based on their arguments and that the relationship was never strong to begin with, you knew that it wasn't going to end um, with them together and their relationship was never going to be fully consummated. So I think the ending is appropriate. Uh, you know, maybe not entirely satisfying, but it is appropriate for the movie. And, and and that's what I'm saying is that I don't find the movie unsatisfying so much as just, um, I just have no reason to really return to this movie. I mean, it just, it's not one of the best romantic comedies I've ever seen. But, um, but here again, look, do I recommend, uh, uh, do I recommend a touch of class? Yes, I do. I think the acting is good enough. I think the writing is good enough. I, you know, it's just not a film that I want to return to. Uh, it's just not a film I want to return to after this commentary. So, and Avco Embassy Pictures release. And but if you want to buy a touch of class on physical media, please don't let me stop you. Uh, it is available from Warner Archive, and you can get it for twenty two dollars. Uh, no bonus features, no bonus features, but uh, you can get it on Blu-ray if you want it on Blu-ray. And also it's, uh, of course, available for rental on Amazon Prime. So that is a touch of class. Uh, thank you very much for joining me tonight. Zachary, uh, thank you so much for your uh, your insight and your comments and everything. It really, I think, punched up the, uh, the commentary as well. I really appreciate your uh, contribution, sir. My next audio commentary will be Saturday night at 10 p.m. for a very popular movie called The Wedding Singer, starring Adam Sandler and Drew Barrymore. And this will be a 25th anniversary commentary for uh, The Wedding Singer. <clears throat> and also, just to let, uh, before I go, just to let everybody know real quick, my uh, future commentaries will include Save the Tiger, on February 18th at 10 p.m. Uh, <clears throat> I'm also going to be doing the original Shaft on February 17th at 10 p.m. And then on Sunday, this Sunday, February 12th at 10 p.m., I will be doing Sounder, starring um, uh, Paul Winfield, Cicely Tyson, and Kevin Hooks uh, with music by Taj Mahal which was nominated for Best Picture in 1972, but sadly lost to The Godfather. So those are my upcoming commentaries. Thank you so much again for joining me for A Touch of Class. And uh, you all have a wonderful evening.